Some of you had an opportunity to join us yesterday while Dr. Jonathan Tripp was in studio between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. We do that on Wednesday mornings. I do have to tell you, he had uh, he had physicals going on, sports physicals, yesterday between 3 and 6 o'clock in the afternoon at his office, which is located on Fillmore Street, directly across from the uh, the old post office, or the main post office. And they'll do that again next week between 3 and 6 p.m., and then they'll do that again the following Wednesday between 3 and 6 p.m. So they're doing this three Wednesdays in a row. That way uh, your children uh, can get prepared and have this done and out of the way so they can participate in fall sports when they go back to school. He'll be back in next Wednesday, joining us between 8.30 and 9 o'clock, and you have an opportunity to give us a call because when was the last time you actually had a friendly voice you could talk to about a medical issue? So feel free to join us again next Wednesday. And remember, as they say at Trip Family Medicine, life's too short not to feel good. So I was looking at uh, my, my computer just before I left work yesterday, and I came across something. It's a video from 1988. The video was actually uploaded to YouTube recently because they didn't have YouTube, as most of you know, back in 1988. That happened to be still in the dark ages. We were driving around in boxy-looking cars, and women had uh, shoulder pads in their uh, their clothes and uh, these great big huge hairdos, and and guys were walking around in mullets. (laughs) It was pretty well, uh, yeah, primitive uh, era that we were living in. 835. In fact, Oprah Winfrey had this great big huge thick head of hair at the time. She was then hosting the most popular television talk show in America, and her guest one day happened to be Donald Trump. This is 27 years ago. Now, at the time, we weren't really dealing with the rise of China. Our fears happened to be mainly centered on Japan, which was just kicking us all over the place in the 1980s when it came to economic growth. And Trump was on Oprah's program, and he happened to be talking about some of his concerns about the direction of the country and the economy and the like. For all those people who say he's just winging it while he's out there campaigning, that he's just pretty much, he's just making a lot of noise and, you know, bloviating and, 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 and just entertaining. Well, listen to what he said 27 years ago and see if you can compare that to his thinking process today. You took out a full-page ad in uh, major U.S. newspapers uh, last year criticizing U.S. foreign policy. What would you do differently, Donald? I'd make our allies, forgetting about the enemies, the enemies you can't talk to so easily, I'd make our allies pay their fair share. We're a debtor nation. Something's going to happen over the next number of years with this country because you can't keep going on losing $200 billion, and yet we, we let Japan come in and dump everything right into our markets and everything. It's not free trade. If you ever go to Japan right now and try to sell something, forget about it, Oprah. Just forget about it. It's almost impossible. They don't have laws against it. They just make it impossible. They come over here. They sell their cars, their VCRs. They knock the hell out of our companies. And, hey, I have tremendous respect for the Japanese people. I mean, you can respect somebody that's beating the hell out of you, but they are beating the hell out of this country. Kuwait, they live like kings. The poorest person in Kuwait, they live like kings. And yet they're not paying. We make it possible for them to sell their oil. Why aren't they paying us 25% of what they're making? It's a joke. This, this sounds like political presidential talk to me. And I know people have talked to you about whether or not you want to run. Would you, would you ever? Probably not. But I, I do get tired of seeing the country ripped Why off. Why would you not? I just don't think I really have the inclination to do it. I love what I'm doing. I really like it. Also, I, it doesn't pay as well. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, I just probably wouldn't do it, Oprah. I probably wouldn't, but I do get tired of seeing what's happening with this country. And if it got so bad, I would never want to rule it out totally because I really am tired of seeing what's happening with this country, how we're, how we're really making other people live like kings, and we're not. Donald Trump, 1988, speaking with Oprah Winfrey about his concerns for the future of the country. And she said, well, you sound like a candidate. He said, I'm not. And then he says, you know, I just don't have any interest in running. But he qualifies that by by saying that if things ever got really to the point where I just couldn't stand it any any longer, I just might. 27 years later, and here he is, a candidate and leading the Republican field at the moment. 838. I think it's a week from today. Is that the first debate they're having with some of these candidates? I, I do believe it is. It's a week from today, I believe, on Fox. I think it's August 6th. We have a caller with us. You're on the air. We've got about a minute before the break. Uh, You're on the air with Bill Colley on Top Story. Yeah, at night, before NAFTA, we had almost no trade imbalance with Canada and Mexico, and now it runs about $150 billion a year. We've lost over 40,000 factories. Uh, several million jobs have gone, and uh, that was before China. And so, uh, for example, like the Korean trade agreement, 
They bring in Hyundai's and Kia's by the millions. We're allowed 75,000 automobiles to go back that direction. Yeah. But if you buy one, you if you're a citizen over there, buy one, you get the equivalent of an IRS audit comes with your purchase. So this is how they protect themselves. And we just let everybody in here just with their junk. And Trump is absolutely right on target. I was going to say, he he, uh, he has not yet faded as so many people have uh, predicted. I'll talk about that a little bit in the next segment as well. I thank you much for the telephone call. That figure, 40,000 factories have left this country. And I think Pat Buchanan was updating that a couple of weeks ago, saying it's now in excess of 50,000. And you think about that, you go, well, that number just sounds very, very large. But when I was a kid growing up, we had a, a, a plant in my hometown called Acme Electric. And they also had plants in Utah, North Carolina, and I believe California. They're all gone. They're now all overseas. If you didn't want a job there or you didn't like your job there, you could drive over the hill to the next town and go to work at Motorola. Motorola's not there any longer. If you didn't like Motorola, you could drive in either direction, east-west, and you could go to work for Dresser Industries. Well, they've pretty much gone. And that's just in one small rural county. And I'm telling you, that's happened all over the country. So forty to 50,000 factories closing up. Seems a very logical conclusion. More on this Trump phenomenon coming up in just a couple of minutes. Bill Colley with you. It's 840-59 at our studio. I think the people in uh, in media, in mainstream media anyway, we're not talking about talk radio. They've been critical of us lately because it's not just a local host, but many of your national talk show hosts do understand why Trump has resonated well with the people. Because we hear it. We get that feed, feedback every day what, via email or whether it be, I've got a slight, by the way. I've been drinking water by the gallon this morning. This happens about once every five years on the radio. I don't think it's the hiccups, but it's something similar. So I may actually play a, another sound clip here and take a deep breath in a moment. But all of these people that, that I've been listening to, uh, after I get off the air, that we carry, Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, uh, Beck to a lesser extent because he hasn't been there the last few weeks while he rests his vocal cords. But as I listen to these people, they they are aware, and they're not endorsing Trump, but they are aware why he is resonating because they take telephone calls every day. They get emails every day from audience members who tell them, yeah, I am just so ticked off with the way things happen to be going in this country. I'm ticked off with John Boehner. I'm ticked off with Mitch McConnell. I'm ticked off with the White House. I'm ticked off with immigration. I'm ticked off with Syrian Muslim refugees coming here that we haven't vetted. And nobody listens to me. Here's Donald Trump who comes along, and Donald Trump says, I'm ticked off about all of those things too. And it really doesn't matter that he may not be a classic conservative. In fact, may not be a conservative in any sense of the, the, the notion that we define it when we're talking about candidates normally running for Republican Party office. And of course, we really haven't had a conservative running as a Republican. I would venture the last conservative who really had a shot to be president of the United States, first of all, Reagan, before him, Barry Goldwater. And unfortunately, he was defeated in the primaries in 1952, but Robert Taft from Ohio. So we don't normally get anyone like that, but but establishment media, here's Here's a, here's a Wall Street Journal headline today, Trump in River City, and it shows a picture of Donald Trump as if he's Professor Hill from, from The Music Man, uh, all gussied up with his, uh, with his uniform on and, uh, and leading, the, uh, leading the band. And here's another one called uh, The Meeting of Trump, or Meetings of Trump. I guess it's plural. This comes from The New York Times. It's seven pages long as these people wring their hands about all of this thing. What, it, what is it that that they can't get. Do they live? There's a story out the other day in the Washington Post, and it said that rich people in this country believe that conditions in this country are just fine. Why? Because they're surrounded in neighborhoods by other rich people. They socialize with other rich people. Other than driving through a neighborhood on the highway once in a while, it's a little run down. They don't see very much of that. And maybe they just dismiss that as being, well, those lazy people don't take care of their property. On the other hand, if you don't live in the Washington Beltway or in Manhattan then you might actually see the world a little differently. I've, I've, I've gone through three separate layoffs in the last 15 years. That's the polite way to say somebody said to me, well, the radio station can no longer afford you. <laughs> I know what that feels like. 847, Bill Colley with, the, uh, with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310. 
KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. You're up next and you're on the air. Well, you know, I listened to Glenn Beck later in the day on your station, and him and Pat and Stu have been really making fun of Trump. And my attitude is yeah, maybe he has done some things that were inconsistent, uh, but maybe he's, you know, realizing, you know, what the real situation is, and he's attending to it. You know, we can all change our minds. And uh, this is a situation, If even if we ended up with Jeb Bush, it would be better than what we've got. And, and, and we've got to somehow get somebody elected that is something better than what we'd have. You know, we would like to be able to turn this boat around like a speedboat, but it's an aircraft carrier, and it's going to take a while. And uh, sure, if we end up with Trump, it's going to be better than what we got. If we end up with Jeff Bush, it's going to be better than what we got. Sure, it'd be great to end up with Cruz, and it's going to be a real interesting flow here. But uh, thanks. That's my comment. Bye. I, I thank you very much for the telephone call. The recent criticism of Trump, earlier in the week at least, from one liberal website was an allegation his, his first wife had made about him. She it was Ivana Trump, his first or second wife. Well, he's been married a lot. That happens to rich people, it seems, when they're more dedicated to business sometimes than home life. But in a, in a divorce uh, uh, proceeding 25 years ago, she had said that her husband attempted to rape her. I, he did not. She never said it actually was rape. She just said she got her clothes torn as they were arguing, and she thought that that was, uh, that was akin to rape. On the other hand, that story dropped after the divorce, and now she supports him for president. And now she says, oh, things are fine between us. I have been through divorce. It's not pretty. It wasn't my idea, but I've been through it. And I tell you, and I knew this from what I heard from the divorce lawyers as well, that all sorts of things are said in court in these divorce proceedings because in some states, because the, the, the narrow definition of what you need to get a divorce it's usually mental cruelty or something like that. So the lawyers have to come up with something. So they just, you know, this this is woven out of thin air. One of the reporters who was trying to pass that story along, saying, well, maybe there's something about Donald's character we should know about here. He was actually laughed off the set of Morning Joe on MSDNC the other day. When the, when the communist network, MSDNC being the mouthpiece for the Democrat Party in this country and all sorts of liberal causes and even socialist causes, when they laugh you off the set for trying to peddle this story, that tells you there's no story there, but it shows you just how badly the elites want to get rid of this man. It's not making some of his fellow Republican candidates happy, I should tell you that. It's 850. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 60 right now, and uh, looking for a high today somewhere in the 80s, maybe reaching even 90 before it's all over with. Bobby Jindal, who seems to be, and when he says I'm moving up in the polls, you say, well, yeah, yeah, they all say that. But he actually does seem to be making some headway lately. Bobby Jindal was appearing on television, and uh, he was on Fox, and he was saying, you know what? I think he was on with Neil Cavuto. He said, we've got to stop attacking Trump because he said it's not helping anybody else in, who's running against him and it's not helping the media. I think the voters are saying they are very frustrated. Republicans told them, give us the majority. They would stop this illegal amnesty. They would repeal Obamacare. They'd shrink the size of the federal budget. It hasn't happened. I think they're looking for an outsider, a truth teller. I think I'm the best qualified candidate. Obviously, I think I'll be the nominee. We've had a very good week, three polls showing that we're gaining ground in Iowa. But when it comes to Donald Trump, what, what I guess the establishment doesn't understand, the more they attack him, the stronger he gets. He enjoys it. Yeah. <laughs> He's not the first person who has said that. You're starting to hear that from a lot of people in media as well, that, that Trump just simply you know, tells them off, tells them where to go. And people applaud that. They're loving it. I, the, the fact that someone is just, you know, it's like giving a fist to a bully. And that's exactly what he's been doing. Now they're starting to call him in media the bully. Why? Because they can't make him grovel and apologize for everything he says. Talk about a bully. Here's a fellow by the name of Daniel Henninger writing at the Wall Street Journal. Henninger is a great guy, I think. I've seen him on television on a various, uh, as a talking head on various shows. He's a superb writer. He has a column called Wonderland that he, he gets published once a week at the Wall Street Journal. 
I have emailed him a few times with a comment or question about his columns, and oddly enough, this guy must be busy. He's at the Wall Street Journal. He must be getting all sorts of feedback. But he always writes a nice note back to me about my comments and maybe answers a question I might have. But it is the Wall Street Journal, and they despise editorially Trump over there because Trump is talking about building a border fence. The Wall Street Journal is a newspaper designed for people on Wall Street. That's why it has that name for corporate America. Corporate America wants huge waves of illegal immigrants because low wages can help increase your bottom line, and that makes corporate America happy. So that's corporatism, not necessarily capitalism. Henninger writing today, the American anxieties Trump has tapped into are real and rational. It is not the Mexican border. It's what everyone in politics, including Hillary Clinton, knows has been the number one concern, the U.S. underachieving economy. And I guess if the economy was booming, they might have a point. There might not be so much intense reaction to illegal immigrants coming to this country working in a canning house. He also says fewer than 30% of the public think the country is on the right track, according to the Real Clear Politics polling average. So Trump obviously knows this because we heard that piece earlier where he was talking with Oprah Winfrey from 27 years ago. If he knew it then, and, and people knew it then, and, and so we've had a couple of times in the last uh, 30 years where people have come out. Ronald Reagan really tapped into this too, if you think about it. For all the talk about Reagan being a conservative, somebody once told me he was more of a populist. He knew the American people were angry about a lot of things, and he promised to try to do something about it. Was he successful? Well, on some counts, some counts he wasn't. Of course, he was dealing with the likes of uh, Tip O'Neill and people like that who kept getting in his way. But he was often able, through public pressure, just appealing to the public, to get the public to pressure the liberals and the Democrats who were in opposition and, and in that case, he sometimes got what he wanted because people would say, wait a minute, look at this. This could be very dangerous for us at the polls if we oppose him. A conservative writer by the name of Ross Dutat, he's a, he's a rare breed at the New York Times, went on vacation. He came back from vacation, says he thought Trump would already be done. And he said he's surprised he's not. He says, here are several theories as to why it's not happened. He says, it's all about immigration. Well, we talked about that a moment ago. Two, it's about Ross Perot. Ross Perot was another one who tapped into that discontent with these two parties, which too often, let's face it, Boehner and McConnell, they are just shades of the liberal party, that is the Democrats. There is no conservative party in America. There is just Democrat and then Democrat light. Now on the local level, we may see things differently, but the local level is not controlling most of these major decisions. In fact, as we have learned over the last couple of months, the local level can't do anything about the fact that we're going to be potentially overrun by a terrorist front in this, uh, in this valley in a couple of months as we bring refugees in here from another part of the world. They can't do anything about it other than just you know, object like the rest of us and no one's listening to them. Dutat writes, number three, it's about a hyper-cautious Republican field. Yeah, that would be Jeb Bush. I don't want to say anything that might offend anybody, and so I love everybody. I'm a conservative, but I'm a compassionate conservative like my brother was, and you know how well that worked out. <laughs> oh, sure, the debt increased, and we didn't stop uh, the porous border from uh, getting more porous, and we couldn't finish the wars, but you know what? I'm a compassionate conservative, and I wouldn't want to make anybody mad. Mitt Romney, John McCain. It's all over again. It's just, it just, you can't get these guys to show that they've got a set. Number four, it's about a populist Republican base that's once again fed up with its leadership. Uh huh. Uh, think Tea Party, think Silent Majority, any number of those. Five, it's about liberation. That is, uh, can we just break the bonds of having to deal with these party leaders? And finally, he concludes with this we're all still a little ways away from fully understanding the Trump phenomenon. And that means that it's unwise to bet too heavily on any specific endgame here. He says, Trump's not going to be in the White House. But, he says, no one knows when he's going to actually get out of this race. I think that's something to keep in mind. You can't write him off. And even if he leaves, somebody else in that grouping is going to be smart enough to pick up the ball and run with it. It appears to be Ted Cruz right now. Cruz is not getting much traction, but if Trump's not in there, then all of that disaffection goes over to, to Cruz's campaign. You're on the air with Bill Colley at 857 on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX. What's on your mind? Morning, Bill. That's, that's exactly what I was calling in for. Uh, the last caller made that point, too. I think Trump 
Trump's going to draw, I mean, you, you have to admit that uh, there's going to be, I would say, millions of people who would normally not watch any debate are going to be tuned into the first debate. And I don't think, personally, Trump's going to do well in the debate, uh, but I think they're going to see people like Ted Cruz, who are extremely articulate, extremely conservative, and they're going to go, whoa, look at this guy. He's the Trump on a political scale. And uh, I think he, people like Cruz should be very grateful that Trump's drawing the attention to, the, to these debates. Well, it, it, I think we have so many candidates just because they all realize there's so much up for grabs that this first debate, they're not all going to be on stage, but for a couple of them, it's make or break. And if they don't, if they don't manage to pull it off, uh, then they're out. I mean, they're, and they're out early. Jim Gilmore, the former governor of Virginia, just one term as governor, just announced that he's a candidate. Why? Because he's thinking a lot of these guys are just going to fade away quickly after these first debates. And then I might get a chance to be in the third or fourth one. I thank you much for the telephone call. I think what really is going to happen here, I'm not saying I want this. I don't want it at all. I want someone who's going to kick the uh, the legs out from under the table. But I think what's happened with John Kasich getting involved in this campaign is that the Republican hierarchy is looking for someone who can be a compromise because we don't want Bush, they don't want Cruz, they don't want Jindal, and they don't want want, uh, 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 Rand Paul. So they're throwing Kasich out there and saying, well, all right, will this be acceptable for everybody in the game? We'll have to see. It's 8.59. Bill Colley with you. One more hour of the program coming up. Oh, Planned Parenthood scores a victory in court. We'll tell you a little bit about that coming up.